Hello and welcome to the first episode of Conversations, a talk show produced and hosted by broadcasting students here at Mount Royal University. We live in the digital age. Each week on this show, we will highlight how technology impacts our lives. Today, we are discussing our privacy in the age of smartphones. My name is Joe Horwood, and this week I'm your host. I'm joined by Dr. Peter Ryan, a professor in the Public Relations Department here at Mount Royal University. Thanks for joining us today, Peter. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, so in this digital age, privacy has definitely become a big concern. Many companies have been caught gathering data, using it for advertising and marketing. What kind of role is our, are our smartphones playing in this? Well, the main role is right when you sign up for any of those apps that you have on your phone that can be wonderful to use because they're very convenient, is that you're agreeing to terms of services that right in them could be giving your data to a third party not just the party you've signed up to, which is, let's say, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, any of these apps that you might have agreed to. You could be agreeing to also link in inside the app to another app, which would be a third party. So right away when you're signing up for these things, if you're not looking at what the terms of services are or what's called an end user license agreement, you can be saying, yeah, just use whatever I've given you and have fun with it. That's it. And so what kind of data are they gathering through these apps as well? So if you've ever used any of these social media apps, so we can think through Facebook, um, they've had a, been in the news a lot for switching how their privacy is engaged. They have a whole suite of options that you can open up and change who can see things like your birth date, your name, if you can be searched for in any search engine like Google or Bing or those sorts of things. Uh, you can turn those things on or off and see what your privacy, what your private information uh, settings are. Not every app you sign up for will allow you to do that. So if you've given Facebook or any of these apps your birth date, your address, your phone number, you can share those things publicly if you have it set to a public setting. And then a lot of people, if they don't really look at what they're signing up for, have already agreed uh, as a default to be giving away any of those pieces of information. And when did all of this data collection, like when did this start? Well, we can think through the early social media coming around in 2005, 2006, when you have things like LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook all coming out. The, we can think through the big five. You can now include Instagram and that and YouTube, which is uh, has also been bought up by uh, other organizations. So the media con concentration in social media is ch changing as things got bought, bought up because Instagram has also been bought up. Mm -hmm. um, so when you think through those sorts of uh, amalgamations of databases, so the back end of a social media app has a database about every single user's uh, information that you've allowed them to have. And if an organization has bought another social media app, they then have the right, right in Facebook's agreement, it says things change over time. We might buy and accrue other uh, companies and they will link the data that they've got from that new, uh, new app that they've purchased, mm -hmm. or new organization. And what, um, what, what are they using that data for? Well, depending what you've agreed to, I mean, we all have the option of putting in incorrect information or creating pseudonyms to protect ourselves if you still want to use the proprietary app. Um, but if you're a lay person that's just decided to use it and have been using it for a long time and you don't check your settings all the time, you could be agreeing for them to share it either with other organizations which will purchase it for money so that then they can either advertise or market to you or people similarly with similar information to you, like they create profiles, and that's what they're using it for, so that they can either create targeted ads and sell more things to you, which some people would like, or in the cases of, especially in politics, what we hear now with organizations like Cambridge Analytica or bots coming out of Russia, they're trying to persuade you to support one candidate over another in an election. And is there a clear way of identifying us, like by our like, do we have an advertising profile that's kind of tied together through these social medias? How are we identified through all of this? So if it's your phone, your phone will have a unique identifier, 
And if it's a computer, it also has an IP address. So if it's consistently that, uh, that you're using those devices, they will tie it to a profile. And it could be tied through Facebook, for instance, would have it because you're using that phone and you might have just given them your phone, your cell phone number right when you signed up so that they can identify for security reasons that it's actually you. And in some of these apps now, especially with iPhones, um, your fingerprint is a security that's letting you know that you're the user that's using it. So that's how they can have even more of an understanding of who is using that device and link it to a, a database with more certainty of who is using the device. Oh, so if I have my IP address on my computer and then I'm unlocking my phone with a fingerprint and I have a unique identifier on both of those devices, would advertising companies be able to tell that both of those devices are tied to me in particular? Well, yes, of course. And I think that's the case that a number of people have realized because immediately if they've searched something in one app, it starts showing up in another one saying, oh, well, we knew you were buying a flight or looking at flights to London or Las Vegas or something like that. And now there's all these ads from a particular uh, airline or another website like Travelocity or Expedia showing up in your app. So most people have al already experienced that phenomenon. Like, have you experienced that? Oh yeah, absolutely. So uh, today even I was on Facebook, I just recently changed my relationship status and on Facebook is an ad for new couples and you can buy these sweaters to get with your new boyfriend. And I was like, oh, this is exactly what I'm about to talk about with Peter later mm -hmm. on. So yeah, it was a great example of exactly that targeted advertising. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what are companies really gaining access to when they're, if, if you're allowing terms and conditions, like are there limits to what they can access on our smartphones? Or is it really anything that they put into the terms and conditions? Uh, well, within Canadian law or in international law, there are limits uh, to the things that they can access uh, or put in under your name. So in Facebook, they're allowed, if you've agreed to it, uh, for them to use your profile and image on certain ads that you might have said, oh, I bought this product or I liked it, especially if you're commenting on another news organization, like a lot of people do through those uh, in, in app services. So a CBC article or something like that pops up and then you comment on it right within your app, then Facebook is allowed to use your, your image on the CBC website, right? Interesting. Wow if you've agreed to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so those, those are some of the cases where cross-platform uses of your personal image or name or username can be seen in other places. Um, so the worry then becomes if you're not aware that that's happening and you're posting something polemic or it could be, uh, especially in Canada where we have hate laws, if someone's po posting some white nationalist story or, or some sort of angle along that, uh, that that's controversial, then it can come back to them and someone could report it to the police or especially death threats. Like those are the things that cross over laws where Facebook would then have to pass on your information if it's at a certain level Absolutely. to the police, to the authorities. Mm -hmm. So just thinking through those kinds of things. There are our limits within our laws. But on the other hand, you can imagine what would happen if every Canadian started to advocate for a privacy dashboard, let's say where you could see every single piece of information Facebook has shared with another app, and then you could delete that information or call it back. That doesn't exist. But you would think for transparency th sake or the protection of our own privacy, this would be something every Canadian would be interested in, saying, mm -hmm. actually, I want to be able to delete my private information from particular companies, or to at least know, yes, I agree to them having this. Is there, I mean, is there currently a, a movement kind of moving towards that, or is that really just something that only people maybe in the communications industry would really be thinking of? Like, are Canadians thinking about this, even though oh, we absolutely. notice it? Oh, absolutely. So the Cambridge Analytica scandal some academics, especially people like Michael Geist, uh, he, he's a lawyer and academic out of Ottawa. He comments on privacy issues a lot. People like Fenwick McKelvey, Elizabeth Dubois, Tamara Small, T Terry Gisson. These are a few people in Canada that at least there are academics and professionals that are working to 
create enlightenment around these issues for Canadians. But unless you have enough people saying things uh, to either petition the government or uh, corporations to change it in favor of the common user, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So that's with, with anything with government. So it's got to be a, enough of a pushback that people are concerned about it. So right now, groups like Open Media are saying that every political party should have a, a code of conduct for how they use bots online. That doesn't exist. There's no regulation around that. And for over 10 years, at least, we're going back to about 2005 through 2008, there's been a, a number of cases where the lack of regulation has caused problems, either for students, the common user. Uh, I can remember one case that was in the news at Ryerson University when I was there at the time, where a student was suspended for creating a study group on Facebook because the instructor had said that students could not work together on the assignment. So only the person that had created the Facebook group was suspended, whereas the other students that were in it uh, weren't. Hmm. And this was a unique case. Uh, but if we think back to that, that case, why didn't the instructor encourage students to collaborate and share knowledge like you would at an institution? Mm -hmm. You know, thinking that that's already something that they were going to do. Exactly. So as far as the government, um, us having to petition the government as the public, why not trying to why not try to gather public opinion in terms of holding the companies accountable? Like, is that really a possibility? Especially with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. I mean, there was there was the the big showing of uh, Mark Zuckerberg at his hearing um, to talk about everything there. So, in a sense, we are sort of holding companies accountable. Um, but do you see that as a possibility as well? Well, right now, I think there's a lot of lobbying from corporations and the gov government parties themselves to keep things at the status quo because governments themselves are making apps that they use during elections to track who's voting for them, who's donating money, and putting that together with in-house polling to see what coalitions of issues they can use to attract voters to gain power. So that could be why things aren't changing. And a lot of Canadians, because of the technical aspect to it, you can just think in this, this conversation itself, There's many different layers to the internet. Are they talking about code in an app or the whole app itself? These, these are so, sort of boundaries that if the average Canadian doesn't see how their information is being used, then how are we going to change things when you need a critical mass of Canadians to call for it? Mm -hmm. Well, even the amount of, um, even the, the data that they can access on your phones, like looking through, I was looking through one social media platform's uh, terms and conditions in their privacy policy, and it includes things like looking at your call log, even though it's a, a picture-based app, there there is no, um, there's no need for them to have your phone number necessarily, uh, but they're able to look through your call logs and see who you've been calling for how long, and then of course, based on that, they can identify your network of people. So I mean, even talking about politics and how governments might be able to identify us, would that also feed into kind of this, the echo chamber that you hear about online where um, maybe if you have very strong conservative views or very strong liberal views, you might see um, advertisements targeted towards those views to sort of help create that echo chamber online? Absolutely, and this is the case that Zuckerberg is putting forward that it's an algorithm. It's you choose what you click on and who you're communicating with in your network. And the algorithm is just a reflection of your choices. So that his argument against Trump is saying that Facebook, Google, these sorts of algorithms are biased against Republicans. And their response is no. The algorithm is completely objective and neutral, reflecting back what people have chosen based off of their desires. However, the big point when it comes to computational propaganda is that people write the algorithms. So what are, are there biases that the organizations can put in there? And usually the bias is towards capital, mm -hmm. right? They want to make more money, more profit. So how can they get more people clicking on things and interacting with their apps, having higher screen time, so that they can sell more advertising and make more money for their organization? Mm -hmm. So like you said, we're responsible for what we click on. Um, and short of having a privacy dashboard, like we hopefully will in a nearer future, hopefully than later, 
what can we do to protect ourselves online? Well, the first thing is you don't have to engage with any of these apps. You don't need to sign up for them. But often in what I do when I'm consulting with an organization in terms of a public relations campaign or a political candidate, we would go through and see what are the messages you want to, to construct in terms of your professional image. And if they already have an account, which most people do at this point, you will go through and sanitize the accounts if they are going to be a public persona or have a public campaign. So you will choose which accounts you want to use, which ones are professional, are there any things like swearing, drinking, or partying, or links with problematic groups that you want to delete right now before this campaign goes forward. So those are kinds of things that you can do professionally. Um, with our students, we talk through at least having one or two accounts that could be open to the public or completely closed down just so you can every month or six months check in online to see what's happening with your own public professional image. So for instance, uh, I often use what I do. Uh, I shouldn't be someone that's on the camera when I'm supporting an organization unless they hire me as a spokesperson. I have, if you search for me right now, there'll probably be, be one image for my faculty image out there. And that's a conscious construction. You know, I control what I put up and I can search every six months. Let's say a story came up about me or an organization I was working with that was negative. There are ways because I have already have accounts created or the person I'm helping, they could have accounts created, that you've created goodwill with all the stories that you've built up. And if you search for that person in Google or Bing, those other stories will appear unless that negative story goes viral. Mm -hmm. So there's a few steps you can take if something negative is about you is out there. The first is to email or contact that person and request that they take it down. If they won't, and it's defamatory or fraudulent, it's a, a lie or, or anything like that, then you can get a lawyer involved and they can send a cease and desist letter or eventually, you know, if it's at that level of fraud, it become a, a court case. Hopefully it doesn't go that far. And if it is, what we would advise someone to do is on those accounts, you can now link them together and create a coordinated campaign. So. You could post one thing and it will show up on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram all at once and drive that tra traffic to one dominant website. And what will this will do in those search engines is that it could bury that negative story and reframe it in a light that you would like. Mm -hmm. Or at least if you're using your accounts, create other stories that will be dominant above that story until it gets taken down. So there's ways that you can empower users to use the tool to protect themselves. And just by having an account, whether it's public or not, or a pseudonym, you will get to become an expert user if you're checking in you know, on a regular basis. Is the internet forever? Like when you have things going up on the internet, we hear that a lot where uh, if you have a picture posted on Facebook, if you delete it, that it still exists. Um, is the internet forever? Can you really truly delete these things if you delete your account? Well, and this is something that search engines and governments are debating right now, whether there will ever be an internet forget button for individuals, especially in court cases. And uh, Google especially uh, and Facebook have been working on this, uh, especially if you're thinking about uh, hate laws or juvenile offenders to protect th those people, they've already done that. You know, they are, there are ways of trying to scrape things off that, off the internet. But a universal button for everyone to delete what is in their account, no, that doesn't exist. And of course, everything we do now is two clicks away from being public. So, mm -hmm. one click to record and one click to post. So, for students, I mean, many of us are in our young 20s, we've grown up with social media, we've grown up with Facebook. I think I got my first Facebook account when I was 14, and of course there was no talk about privacy at that point in time. You know, you had a couple people telling you, don't post certain things on Facebook because you don't want it to come back to haunt you. Yeah. But when you're younger, you don't think about it like that at all. Um, so I mean, we have long histories of ourselves out there. Short of going through and trying to delete this and push it to the bottom, 
are we able to, is there really anything that students can do and protect themselves going forward as far as our, uh, the data that we are putting online? If I go and I'm changing my birth date and things like that, um, can that help at least try to m mitigate what we've, maybe the damage that we've already caused ourselves? Absolutely. So one of the first exercises I do with my students in our second year financial PR class is I tell them, open up a uh, search engine, whatever search engine you want, and turn to the person next to you and say, ask them, can I Google you to see what's out there publicly about you so that I can then advise you about how to shape your professional image online if they haven't done it before. Because that is a sensitive thing. Maybe there is a story out there that's negative about a student that they don't want. So at least they can say, say no, or I'll do it myself, or reframe it. They don't have to do it, but they're PR students, so they're already quite aware of this stuff mm -hmm. by the second year. And they generally go ahead and search each other and say, oh yeah, I don't. Most commonly, the statement is, there isn't anything out there online about me. So that's the other problem. How do you start to create your professional image? Mm -hmm. And we usually say if the students want to, no one ever has to because these are technologies that aren't supported by Mount Royal University. So it's up to them if they want to use a proprietary software from, or an app from outside the university. But we generally suggest you know, use Twitter or uh, LinkedIn as professional accounts and start you know, to work with your peers to create your professional image for PR. And this is important for students because Yes, if there's something negative about them and it's not viral yet, so it's not public, maybe they just had some party pictures from high school, they can take that all down and have another pair of professional eyes say, yeah, close this down, reset all your privacy settings, and start to craft your professional image on accounts that are commonly used for professional communication. And so that students over the, their, the span of their degree will get practice with that and some of the best practices for crafting their professional image. Mm -hmm. And basically, it's a good rule of thumb is don't put up anything you wouldn't want your grandparents to see, <laughs> right? Yeah, so delete what's out there, change your information often, hopefully, and try to maybe offset that, the advertising identifiers, try and mitigate that. And uh, Twitter and LinkedIn maybe more than Facebook and Snapchat, maybe for the professionalism. Well, and there's so many apps now. It depends what industry you're going into, right? Which ones you'll want to be familiar with. Mm -hmm. but like, if you're going in the fashion industry, Instagram might be great. Of course. Right? So yeah. that would be tailored to a particular degree or background or industry that you want to go into. Mm -hmm. Is there any other advice that you would have for students that maybe are realizing that they've damaged their privacy through their online uh, profiles? Anything else that you would advise students to do? The other advice, well, more knowledge is always empowering, right? So um, commonly working with what technologies are out there so that you have a basic understanding and then to the point where you could feel confident advising other people on it, mm -hmm. that's how familiar you should be with this to protect yourself. Because if you don't feel confident in using an application like Facebook, Instagram, or know where your information is going, then it could negatively impact you in the long run, especially if a newer company comes along or a new app. Because 10 years ago, blogs were the big thing, mm -hmm. right? And in the most recent 2015 election, all the political parties in Alberta, at least, uh, took the RS feed icon off so that people can automatically aggregate, even though that's the technology used in every single news feed and every single app that we have. So your yeah. Facebook feed, they all use RSS, which is, well, the short form most people use is really simple syndication, but it actually stands for Resource Description fa uh, Framework Syndication, RDF syndication, which is like a coding language, HTML, XML, it's a form of XML. Uh, but that might be getting too technical for this talk. <laughs> no worries. Maybe yeah. we can have you on again uh, maybe next semester. We'll see. We can dive a little deeper. Mm -hmm. We're all out of time today. So thank you so much for coming in and joining us today, Peter. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me again. Absolutely. Um, you guys can tune in this time next week for another episode of Conversations. Ryan Robinson will be here discussing how activism and Tibet in the digital world uh, is being affected in the digital world with Dr. Tashi Sering. I'm Joe Horwood. Thanks for joining us.